Um, I, I'm going to talk about two translations I've made of books that deal with the Danish Norwegian. And I, I feel I have to include Norway because, because it was Denmark Norway at that time. Um, the trading activities on what was called the Gold Coast or, or the coast of Guinea in West Africa. The first um, was written by a, the chaplain at Fredericksburg Castle at Fetu, Wilhelm Johann Müller, and was published in Hamburg in 1673. The second was written by Thorkel Hansen and was published in Copenhagen in, 16, in 1967. Both accounts have forts or castles as their centers of reference. And these forts were built to hold slaves and important merchandise and to protect the European occupiers, mainly from European neighbors and competitors. Yet these are very different books. Um, Müller writes a report to the Danish king about the area and people of Fetu on the Gold Coast. He reports facts as he sees them and according to how he understands, understands his surroundings. He hardly mentions the Danes he are working with and he doesn't say that the Danish presence on the Gold Coast was to deal in slaves. That's not mentioned in his books. It's not touched on at all. He talks about other merchandise um, French uh, cognac, you know, cognac and such things, and muskets and all types of things, but not slaves. Um, Hansen, on the other hand, writes about the Danes who were engaged in the slave trade on the Gold Coast. He is not an eyewitness, so he interprets what other eyewitnesses have reported, and through them comes to his own conclusions. We once had a fort in Africa. This is how Tokel Hansen opens his book, Coast of Slaves. Well, we had many forts in Africa, but only one remains, and that is Christiansborg, which is in Accra. What were we doing in Africa? Well, we were there because of the very lucrative trade in human beings, in slaves. So we got a foothold on the coast of Guinea, and then we needed ships to ferry this human load across the Atlantic. But before that, we had to fill these ships with merchandise um, to be used to purchase slaves with. Muskets, gunpowder, expensive cloth, beads, mirrors, brandy and wine. Essentially luxury articles. As Hansen puts it, the whole economy of the coast is based on the slave trade. Movable as well as immovable property is valued according to its worth in slaves. The only permanent currency in Africa is Africans. If a man cannot pay his debts within a time, his creditors has the right to take one or more persons from his family and sell them as slaves to cover his loss. This is called panyaring and is so common that the Negro children on the slave ships play panyaring with each other. Free Negroes who come on errands to the forts are often apprehended by the guard and thereupon put in chains by Christian soldiers and panyard. On the other hand, it is not rare that natives give their children or others of the family to the Danish authorities as surety in order to obtain a considerable amount of merchandise, especially brandy, that then has to be paid for within a certain time. If this does not happen, that which guaranteed the loan is sold. Not a very nice picture of the situation. So we were on the coast of Guinea for 200 years. It all started with the seizure of Swedish 
trading lodges in 1659 <coughs> by Henrik Karloff, a Dutchman who had switched from Dutch service to Swedish and then to Danish service. I'll first talk about Müller's book, Die Afrikanische auf der Guineischen Goldküst gelegene Landschaft Fetu, published in Hamburg in 1673, and which is an account of the Fetu area on the Gold Coast where the Danes had built the fort Fredericksburg. This fort had been built on a hill close to the sea. That is Müller's drawing of Fredericksburg on top of this hill. We can't see very much of it. Um, let me see. And this is later, it became Fort Amsterdam and it is sort of the ruins of it is still there today. And so this is what Müller writes. Fredericksburg bears the name of Frederick III, King of Denmark and Norway of blessed memory and is the foremost and most important station of the African Trading Company and it was negotiated for in Africa by the Royal Danish Africa Company at its main place of trade. The fort is situated on a hill so close to the beach that one can throw a stone from the fort into the water. It is not situated further than a musket shot from Cabo Corso, which is today's Cape Coast. The height of this hill is about 300 steps, not estimated perpendicularly, but according to the number of steps used when one walks up to it, as I have done at least 10 times while counting them. And of course, for a Dane, this hill must have been like Himmelbjerg, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, this is the coast of Ghana today. And we can see Cape Coast here, and then around here. Can you see me? Yes. It's not very far. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, Fredericksburg. It was, you know, you could, you could shoot from, <laughs> they could <laughs> shoot at each other. That's how close it was. Um, this is, the coast of Ghana, today's Ghana, is 539 kilometers. Um, and it borders the Ivory Coast in the west and Togo in the east. To put these narratives I'm going to talk about in perspective, it must be mentioned that we recognize, recognize that the Gold Coast had a fort or trading post every 10 kilometers. It was just a very lucrative trade. Um, it was very, I mean, the area to trade in was very lucrative, and many nations wanted a share of it. Denmark later lost Fredericksburg <coughs> to the English, but it managed to hold on to, Fredericks, uh, to Christiansborg in Accra, um, which the second book, Hansen's book, will deal with. Now, Müller he was born in 1630 near Hamburg. And in 61, he was ordained a Lutheran pastor and entered the service of the Danish Grugsta Company as chaplain to Fredericksburg. He arrived in December 62 and spent close to seven years there and left in 69. The land he came to was, of course, for him strange and alien. It was inhabited by people who both looked and behaved differently from what he was familiar with. He did not understand this new world, but he tried to become familiar with it, and he therefore accessed the people according to his own ethnocentric understanding and values. On the other hand, we must not forget that he had studied theology to become an, adorn, adorn, uh, an ordained reverend minister of the Danish Lutheran Church, and so his reactions to fear to <clears throat> were not very different from those of later missionaries on the Gold Coast of Ghana. What Müller observes is often measured according to his Christian set of values, but he is most often impressed and amazed by what 
he experiences. And he mentions things like uh, they, they don't, um, they let their children develop without binding their legs, so they, but they have still got straight legs, you know. They haven't got crooked legs, for example. And he mentioned an interesting thing. If anybody has been to Ghana, you must have known that when people greet each other, they hook that middle finger. I always thought it's an unpleasant thing, so I, I you know, this is, this is described okay. from, from the middle of the, of the 17th century, which is as old as that, yeah. And, and many other things I, I, I can't go into him. Um, and of course he's very, very concerned with their fetichio bas baskets, this is where they held their sacred things. But on the other hand, he must have been very lonely because he never refers really to the Danes he is working with or what is going on at Fritz Boat. It's as if he, he doesn't come, he has nothing to do with them. And you can understand it. I mean, this was a young Christian chaplain, you know, probably a very nice, honorable, decent young man. And his company was not probably the very best up the hill. So, um, so I think he found a good company in the local people. So on the whole, he shows a positive attitude to what he observes and experiences. He learns to value the appearance of the people, their skills, their crafts and intelligence, and comes to admire them, their graciousness, their expression of respect and hospitality and their demonstration of gratitude. In the same way that the Lord God has given the people of it to land straight back and agile limbs, he has also provided them with intelligence, sense and a wisdom. They have keen memory. Even though they can neither read nor write, they, are, they for a very long time remember clearly things that have happened. Many of them boast about their good memory. A distinguished trader once said to me, if we, the Christians, had not been able to read or write the letters, they, the indigenes, would have taken over from us. For even if they do not have books or written material, they know their calculations. And even if they can run into many thousands, they manage to keep them in their head. And this is true. This is also the case today with traders in West Africa. They have an incredible memory in numbers. And from that, the people of Fetu are in their ways quite wise. They are also calculating. This can be observed not only in trading and sales, but also in calculating the seasons. According to them, a whole year is divided into eight months, so that no mistake is made in the estimation of time of a year. They make at every new moon a knot on a rope, made from plant fiber. Each knot means one month. Such knots are also used to estimate the age of a person and also the time for the festival that is held in Fetu in September every year. The Europeans in Fetu tend to wonder that these indigenes, who many of them consider stupid and uneducated people, can estimate the time of this festival so accurately. The times Müller describes were violent, caused by the throng of European states competing over the spoils of the trade Fetu facilitated. From the middle of the 17th century, 27 European forts were built in the coast, on the Gold Coast by seven different European countries. The currency used was gold, as well as European copper, silver and gold coins of varying value. The Europeans in Fetu can best be described as an assemblage of operatives employed by these different European states referred to in the book. And they were a mix of official appointees, a ragtag of opportunists, more, more pirates than adventurers. So along this short coastal stretch we find the Dutch, who had got rid of the Portuguese, the English, 
the Brandenburgers are the Germans, the French for a short time, the Swedes a bit longer, they lost Cape Coast Castle to the British in the end. And then the Danes who finally had to give up their activities in Fetu and concentrate on the areas further east, from Christiansborg at Osu to Prinzenstein at Keta beyond the River Volta. <clears throat> These European trading posts, with their fortifications along the coast coast, were constantly fighting with one another, establishing pacts only to break them and forging alliances with local chiefs, all with the get aim of getting hold of each other's merchandise and forts, and thereby the control of the lucrative trade. In the process, treaties were drawn and redrawn, and the strongest and wiliest won the day. So Müller had more in common with the devil worshippers in Fetu than the Christians in the forts. Müller's language was German, as Schleswig-Holstein at the time were Danish, and so he wrote this report on Fetu in German to the Danish king, Christian V, who was from 1670, after he had returned to Denmark. Little is left of Christiansburg, but the massive Cape Coast castle remains, as one of the three remaining mighty slave forts in Ghana. Cape Coast, which is called Cabo Corso here, Elmina and Christiansborg. These are the three remaining forts, really. Müller's book is of great anthropological, linguistic and also historic interest. It is a detailed account of the geographic area, of its people, of their religion, their occupations, where the fishermen traders, artisans, blacksmiths, goldsmiths, farmer, <clears throat> with the various classes of people and what they wear, which trading goods they prefer, their ostentation, what they fish and how they fish, what they grow and how they prepare their fields, how they build their, build their dwellings, what they eat and how they prepare their food, how their society structures, how they go to war and with what type of weapons, their legal system, their cultural practices, but also their graciousness, their hospitality, their expression of all very interesting information on the language they spoke. For Müller describes the Akan dialect Fante, as it was 350 years ago. Yet the Fetu people, the Futu, were Guan. And this is interesting that Akan was so early on the Gold Coast. However, Müller describes Fetu as a society that has many elements of the matrilineal society, and thus they are of more Akan than Guan. Yet the Fetu people refer to the inland traders as Akan, not they don't sort of look at themselves. The second book I will talk about is The Coast of Slaves, Slavonis Schist. This is Tokel Hansen's impressions of especially Christiansborg castle in Accra, but also the other Danish fortifications built along the coast, eastwards in the then Danish influence area and what is today Ghana. And these forts were at Teshit, at Augustaborg, at Mingo, Fredericksburg, Ada, Kongensten, at Keta, Fred, uh, Prinzenstein. A Coast of Slaves is the first in Hans's trilogy on the Danish-Norwegian slave trade. The other two are ships of slaves and islands of slaves. It's impossible to give a real impression or overview of this great book in a, in a short seminar. So I can only give a few impressions and quotes here and there. Torkel Hansen's an artist, he's a fine writer, and whose books probe the daring, exceptional person from Pondopidan to Hansen to Camus to Bixen is a very different book from Fetu. Um, the Coast of Slaves is about history, about the Danish-Norwegian trading activities in slaves on the Gold Coast. He also tries to answer the question, what did we leave behind? Footprints in the sand, this is a metaphor he uses. Well, we have several surviving eyewitness accounts published in Denmark. Danish and Danish surnames have survived in Accra, Quist, Hansen, Larsen, Wolf, Luftal, Hams, etc. 
For the Danish labels were clear, clearly quite fertile. This is not a novel, as some have described it. It's faction, no, I don't think so. It, it, it is a very different type of book. And it is not a historical treaty, yet the, the author has delved deeply into the Royal Danish archives. With a critical eye, he has read what the eyewitnesses had to narrate. He has read Tillemann, Rask, Römer, Kjöge, Isart and Monrad. He has read the official as well as the available private correspondence. So he looks critically at his sources, adds his creative genius and his imagination. And we get a book of great artistic value, as well as of deep historical insight and interpretation. I will read some excerpts that show his artistry. The book opens with the author entering Christian Small Castle. And this is the entering, yes. And he opens, we once had a fort in Africa. It is still there. Create erected on a low promontory of rock where the coastline extends a foot into the ocean. The oft whitewashed walls are visible among the palms. Over the portal, the emblem of Christian VII, can still be seen. Every time a palm branch nearly wafts in the wind, it sweeps its floating shadow back and forth over the initials as if in an attempt to wipe out, out the old inscription. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's all beautifully written, that. This is Christian's book from the back side. Actually, I, had a, I, I took this from the, from the internet. I had a much better picture of it. It was taken by the photographer from Institute of African Study, and it is not it's not a blue sky that day, it is, it is, it's much better. I, I, it was very difficult to transfer things. So this is, this is, the, this is, the, this is where the, the, the canoes must have come around to bring them out. This is a past that Danes and Norwegians have wished to get rid of. Yet Queen Margrethe, on her visit to, the, to Ghana a few years back, apologised to Ghana for Denmark's involvement in the slave trade. In Norway, it was a discovery of the slave ships Fredensborg, both built in Copenhagen in 1763, shipwright wrecked in a storm outside Arendal in 1768, a wreck that divers located in 1974, that reminded Norwegians that the slave trade was also part of Norwegian naval history. Norwegians might have wanted to totally wash their hands of the whole slave history with the excuse that we were under Denmark, you know, so we had nothing to do with it. Yet our Norwegian naval hero, Tordenskjold's first voyage was a deckhand on a slave ship. And the church annals from Christiansborg record the burial of several Norwegian sailors. So who were these our great-great-great-grandfathers who traded in human beings and who treated them atrociously? According to Trockel Hansen's, and this is also courtyard of Christiansborg today, and this is the steps that led down into the passage. This is where, where the slaves left to get out. Christian Hansen says only very few coastmen in the long survived. The average rate of survival on the fort was, much, was not much over one year, and many who arrived on a Monday had their epitaphs read in church on the following Sunday. Others became mental wrecks long before they destroyed themselves physically. The climate fever saved their lives, but attacked their character, dulled their senses, made them bilious and irritable until they reached a point where their only pleasure entailed malevolent brutality. Far from home, with months and years between the letters from the closest, 
destroyed by the heat, the fever, drunkenness and venereal disease, embittered at each other and damning their own misery, these white demons sat in their white fort and waited for the people from the rainforest. Well, climate fever, which we hear many references to, is of course uh, a whole cocktail of physical ailments, malaria, yellow fever, typhoid, guinea worms, diphtheria. Because we are in an age before the discovery of bacteria, bacterial cause of disease. Um, if one considered that the core chart of Christian's board, they had a, a well there, it's a still there, the Christ built it, uh, that collected the rainwater that washed down from above, you know, all the dirt at Christian's Borg ended up in this well. Um, then I can understand that they arrived on Monday and the epithet was read on Sunday. It was not known that the mosquito caused malaria and yellow fever and that cleanliness could prevent disease was not known. Miller, for instance, he thinks that this excessive bathing and daily ablutions of the fat of bird people must be unhealthy. Yeah. Hansen further describes the socio historical setting of the people from the rainforest, that is, the slaves that come to them. They were not savages, nor cannibals, nor Stone Age people. True, many of them had never seen a wheel, but they had developed their own legal system, their own architecture and their own music. They wrought metals, had a superior art of pottery and textile, owned extensive farming lands and engaged in goat and sheep husbandry. But this did not help them when the Europeans arrived. They had not properly followed the developments in world history. They had been excluded by the Atlantic Ocean, by the Indian Ocean, by the Sahara. In three important areas they clearly lagged behind the strangers. They did not have a writing system. And even worse, they did not know how to distill liquor. And even worse still, they did not how, know how to mix coal dust, saltpeter and sulphur in the right quantity. They were not civilized. They did not know how to make gunpowder. Europeans could do all these things. But there was also a botanist come from a physician who studied the people in a similar way to Müller, Isert. He was a close friend of the last major slaver, Schöger. Isa dreamed of plantations in Aquapim on the hills above Accra, so that the slaves could work there and not be forced across the Atlantic. Yes, he was a dreamer. Yeah. He died at Christian's Borg, as did his wife and newborn daughter. Hansen hints at something sinister, but we have no witness accounts, it's merely a problem solved. Because Esert was obviously a problem for people at Christiansborg. So as the Danes moved eastward along the coast, they wanted to get hold of the River Volta estuary in the hope of ferrying slaves along the river from the inland. But they needed to defeat those who controlled the opposite bank the Anlaw. This was the mighty Governor Churgus' claim. The following excerpt signifies Hansen's reaction to the River Volta, which is also called the Leaping River. Here his narrative blends the slave trader Churgus' near Napoleonic compulsion to cross this mighty river to defeat his enemy, the Anlaw, on the other side and then the near Shakespearean warning. This is a river Volta part of it today. The dead lived on the other side of the river. The slaves as Kongenstein said that they could see the ghost dance at night on the fields yonder. And when a slave was buried in Accra, 
he needed to take some gifts along that he could give a leper woman who watched the jetty. Otherwise, he would not cross before he had licked her wounds. Churga did triumph over the Anlo in the final battle at Potterbra, but it was an expensive victory. In the next seven hours, he let Negroes lose on Negroes, the mighty athletes of Aquapim, the courageous warriors from Adar. Yes, finally, he even sacrificed the dearly bought slaves from Christiansborg. Churga then built the impressive Fort Prinzenstein at Keta, across the river from Kongenstein at Adar to manifest his victory and Danish power. But his African empire was already crumbling. The market for slaves had plummeted worldwide, mainly due to the after effects of both the French and the American revolutions. Today we would say the market was uneasy. He anticipated glorious return, and he would have a glorious return to Copenhagen as a very wealthy man, ready to marry well and start a Danish family. But all this disappeared before his eyes, and he lost all. He died soon after, a broken man, deprived of his dreams as well as his wealth. And Hansen, the artist, also has to cross the Volta. Within the minute it has taken the motorized barge to sail across the Volta, darkness has fallen. The whole sunset has drained into the sea and the river melted from brass to liquid silver. At Soga Copper, the water carriers walk home like coal black shapes against a sky fully red towards the west. In the bush, the nightly African double concerto starts, the shrill treble of the cicada and the Duncan drone of the toads. Already when Hansen walked around the remains of the then prison at Prinzenstein, the sea was about to claim it. Today it's nearly gone, as are all other fortresses apart from, apart from Christiansborg, and I quote, Suddenly your eyes are blocked by the enormous slanting walls, with all the four bastions still intact, whitewashed above a metre-high tarred footage, resting devoid of dimensions in itself, like all well-proportioned building, and only lit by the moon that is about to sink into the sea. Here lies Jens Aldolf Schöger's Prinzenstein an iron cannon on one of the bastions aims one eye at Sirius. This is Fred Prinzenstein today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nearly gone. Yeah. So only Christiansborg, ruins and a few surnames are left of the Danes 200 years on the Gold Coast. Yeah. This is what I had to say. <laughs>